Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mark's Backyard Birds, another edition of a live session with some Q&A opportunities here. And I would plan on, you know, doing at least a, once a month, doing a monthly update. This one can, called the January Wild Bird Update uh, and, you know, questions and answers session. I always welcome. Uh, and what I do on these sessions is I, I you know, I just talk about kind of what's going on in the, the wild bird world this month. And remember, I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm right here in the middle of the country. And when I talk about uh, dates and, and things that are going on, if you live to the north or you live to the south, uh, you know, and, and other parts of the world that, that uh, you know, the dates may not coincide exactly. You may be a little earlier, a little later than us, but uh, it should be somewhere in the neighborhood. So, and I'll do my best to answer uh, questions. Uh, we do love it whenever you uh, join in and you uh, post to us know where you are from and uh, post that up there and what part of the country, because that really helps me when I'm answering your question. If you do have a question, it's uh, uh, different birds and different conditions in different parts of the world. So, um, you know, so the first start January, uh, this, this literally this coming week uh, is typically the coldest week of the year uh, in our part of the world. Say that being said, well, we had uh, 50 some degrees yesterday in the last couple three days, uh, but we're back down in the 30s today. So it's getting more like winter. Hey, Steve from Alabama. Excellent. Stormy. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you're safe. I, they, I've heard about those storms way down in uh, Alabama today. Severe weather outbreak. So with also with you, we, we deal with those severe weather um, outbreaks here, usually more in April and May uh, in this part of the country. But uh, you guys, man, it, it looked like it was terrible down there today. And I've also with you. So um yeah, the, it, and, and uh, that people ask about how birds survive those storms, and and as the great Roger Tory Peterson used to say, uh, birds have wings, and it's a good thing they do for in some of those conditions, so they can and they can sense barometric pressure and get out of there. So uh, something, and there's Dave from Rhode Island, and Shirley from Texas. <laughs> you have a cool day in Texas. What is a cool day in Texas? Uh, uh, Surely, I I, I I know that you guys have had a couple of bad uh, cold stretches with some pipes freezing the last couple of years. So, um, you know, we just got back from North Carolina last week and, and South Carolina down that area with family and people were freezing because the highs were really in the 40s and 50s. And they're not used to that down there. Uh, so they were really and oh, soggy on uh, Toronto. Uh, uh, welcome, Adrian. We. Uh, they, yeah, it's, I, I love how and seeing where everybody comes in from, from all around the country. It really, it amazes me. And, I, and, it, and of course, it does my heart good to know that everybody, you know, the, all this parts of the world, you're interested in birds and bird feeding and, and we love it. So, so no matter what your conditions are, where you are, this is, you know, January tends to be an interesting month for birds. And, and it is a lot about survival. You know, what, what can they do? Um, we're, you know, a, a, this is one of the busiest bird feeding months that we experience here. And we, uh, we recommend some of the most important things. And if you've ever watched one of my, my lives, you know that I talk about unfrozen water. Um, and so I'm going to start with that just because I think that's the single most important thing we can do for birds. Wild birds, especially uh, unfrozen water at this time of year is generally a premium. The last few days, it's been a little more available, but we're really dry here in the Kansas City region, too. We're kind of in a mild drought. Uh, so just to the north of us, it's a little worse and, and around. But finding a, a dependable source of unfrozen water and clean water is is critical for bird survival. And where you are, you know, if it, 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 the weather's nicer. Ooh, sure, it's 57 in Texas. I know you guys are probably pretty cool down there. So the... Uh, the, the unfrozen water is important. A heated bird bath, uh, the bird bath, the ice are so important. So I, I get that out first. I tell you, when I do uh, garden club programs, Kiwanis clubs and Rotary Club, all those kind of programs, 
I said, food, water, and shelter. And water is number one, the most important thing you do that you can do for birds. So, uh, but also when this time of year we're talking about, oh, what's the earliest birds begin nesting? Should I stop feeding peanuts during the period because of choking? Uh, you know, I, 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 right now, uh, I was going to uh, talk also about uh, bird nesting. And in our area uh, here in Kansas City, about the only two birds that are, are, are in the nesting uh, process right now are the uh, great horned owl here and uh, the bald eagles are already you know laying eggs and starting to sit. But the uh, for songbirds in our area, nesting typically doesn't start until really March and for a lot of birds, uh, especially our resident birds start in March, our, our migrant birds like orioles and hummingbirds and stuff, not till probably mid to late April. So I know this weekend, whenever, when we were in North Carolina, and we were also in, in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for a few days, the birds were singing like crazy. Uh, there, there was a lot of uh, kind of early nesting behavior going on down there, setting up territories and it's all pairs of birds and things. So you don't have to go very far to the south to, for nesting to start. Um, if it, it, you guys down in, in like coastal areas of Louisiana and, and Alabama and places, uh, the purple martins are already starting to show up down there. They they start showing up in, in mid January to late January, uh, where we won't get them for a couple more months. Um, so you know, depending upon where you're watching it from, <laughs> the nesting can start really early. I I, I never stop feeding peanuts. Um, peanuts are you know, a, a food for me 365 days a year because it is so high in oil and high in fat. Uh, and it's very important for uh, for birds, a source of them. And as long as you're providing a, uh, a dependable source of water, this is kind of the same thing with dried mealworms. I've heard uh, people voice concerns over how dry the dried mealworms are uh, for birds and for young birds. But as long as you depend provide a dependable source of water, then that should not be a, a uh, concern for you. So no, I, I do not uh, stop feeding peanuts. I have always fed them in the 30 some years I've been feeding birds. So, um, but the, the early bird nesting birds you think of right now, and, and it especially, I mean, it could just as easily be negative six here right now, like it was a few weeks ago. Uh, and you have a bird like the great horned owl uh, in the picture here, they're, they're already in their nesting cycle and they're ferocious birds and they um, you know, you, you, is it easier to catch a rabbit on a, a, with a blanket of snow on the ground for a background or a rabbit with their, you know, brown leaf litter? So, you know, they're they're very efficient hunters and in, in catching food to feed their babies that are already starting to hatch. Uh, and, and, they, you know, they're covered down, as you can see here. So you got to be a pretty hardy bird to start uh, nesting this early. Uh, probably the uh, of the songbirds, if you want to call them that. The earliest to start nesting are the morning doves. Uh, morning doves have multiple uh, nests per year and they start very early. Uh, so that's probably the first on the list of, you know, when the birds start you know, start nesting. I've seen them, I uh, remember in North Carolina in college, uh, outside our library, there was a morning dove nesting in a, a shrub and she had snow on her back. Uh, you know, they, they start very early and, and uh, nest several times during a season. So um, the other bird that uh, is, start, is nesting, of course, are the bald eagles. Uh, they're already laying eggs. Um, and the reason I brought this picture up, because this is a, a great example of um, what's called reverse sexual dimorphism. Uh, in birds, uh, you know, typically, and a lot of wildlife, you know, the males are larger than the females. Well, in birds of prey, like these, these bald eagles, um, actually the larger bird on the right is the female and the smaller bird on the left is the male. And like I said, it's, it's called reverse sexual dimorphism. And, and they think that they think it mainly has to do with, of course, that the females have to carry the eggs in the early part of development before they, they lay them and, and, of course, need a little bit larger body. Uh, but uh, it's one of the, like I said, it's a really, it goes against the grain of a lot of thinking. So I thought that was an interesting fact way to put in here and I'll let you see tonight. Uh, this is a, taken at a local lake here in Kansas City. But the, yeah, the, the females are larger than the males. So uh, and, and nesting is it, it, it is going on in very few birds. Now, what is going on in a lot of birds, of course, is just survival. 
And we've talked about where birds roost at night, where they sleep at night, and where they can get out of conditions. And I had uh, uh, this conversation today about bluebirds and uh, using nest boxes. And yes, bluebirds will use nest boxes uh, in, in, in the winter months to, to roost in. There's some famous photos taken of a stack of bluebirds stacked in, on top of each other in a box to keep warm on a really cold night. Um, but, you know, a lot of times they will just use a nice thick evergreen bush uh, and to get in and out of the cover, you know, get it, it help break the wind. But there are commercial products that, you know, that you can buy uh, and, and put up for them for them to nest in. This is actually a roosting box, um, which is, is kind of a double wide uh, bluebird house. Uh, the way I like to think of it. And the hole and doors at the bottom and inside the box, there are rods running across in there for the, the birds to get up on. Or And this way, the wind and the cold air is down here at the bottom and the birds are a little warmer up at the top. Um, this is, a, 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 you know, kind of a, a, a more elaborate one. And another thing that we see is uh, and we have available that's much simpler uh, are the roosting pockets. And these are. Uh, you can put several of these up in your garden. This kind of, I believe these got started in England years and years ago. Uh, we saw quite a few of them, and and they're not they're not meant to be nesting pockets. These are meant for birds to be able to get in out of the cold. And you can put them all in your landscaping, in your gardens, under your decks, and little tucked away places. You know, Carolina wrens love getting up into little uh, tight places up in your deck and, and places so they get out of the wind and, and they're kind of safer from predators. Well, uh, these little roosting pockets are great additions and you can put them up all throughout your landscaping and gardens to, to help them have a place to get in out of the weather. Chickadees are famous for using them. Carolina wrens, even house finches use them. I mean, they're not big for really big birds like morning doves, but they, they're great little uh, roosting pockets for to help provide some cover. But landscaping, my goodness, landscaping is the key, you know, if you uh, make sure you have some evergreen bushes or shrubs, uh, you have a lot of birds roosting in those at night. All right, let's see. Hi, Joshua from Michigan. What are your thoughts on nesting shelves? I've seen them marketed and think uh, robins, cardinals, doves, etc. We use them. Yeah, the the nesting shelves. The t morning doves may use them if they're big enough. Uh, I think we've sold them uh, for a few years. We all sell a lot of them, but robins, I have a, a good customer sent me a picture of a robin nesting on one of her nest shelves. Um, and it depends on how, if it's like almost a little bit enclosed on the sides and stuff. I've seen house finches use them, um, but the, the morning doves are kind of the main target. The morning doves and the ro uh, robins are the main target birds for using those nesting shelves. Um, but again, you, you, you put them up and you hope, just like a regular birdhouse. Any birdhouse you put up, there's never any guarantee they're going to use them. Um, there, I got asked one time. Uh, I was uh, and testifying about a, a, a overpass that was being put in, and these owls were going to be displaced. And they were asking me, um, "Were you know, it, why do those owls nest there?" Right, you know. And that's an impossible question to ask. The same thing, why they choose one nest box over another nest box, we just don't know. I mean, it could be anything. It could be wind direction. It could be sun angle. It can be um, maybe when they started to build a nest, a cat walked by and the birds left it and they won't go back to it because they have a, a negative impact. There's a lot of things that influence, you know, a, a bird's decision to where it's going to, to nest and roost. But um, yeah, those nesting platforms, they can be used because robins, you know, tend to, hey, we had one nest uh, on our, uh, second floor windowsill in my daughter's bedroom years ago. And she used to come on every day after school and peek out there and check on the robin babies. And so they do like those little flat surfaces like a, a commercial nesting shelf and, and they are readily available, that's for sure. You know, it, it, you know, it, it's it early. I know in the South, it, it, it's not too early to be talking about nesting, but our area, it's really early in the game. One of the things that, that that's going on in January in this part of the world, as we start to see some unusual words that may be coming into our area for the first time during the winter, and this is a common red pole. And those are birds that we don't get a lot of in Kansas City, just to our north. And, you know, Omaha gets a lot more, and obviously Minnesota and, and northern. So this is a, you know, a, a bird that nests very high on the planet, <laughs> very up in, in Greenland and Iceland and northern Canada. 
Um, but they, they winter uh, across, especially across southern Canada and the northern tier states. And But Ruth, who works for me and has lived here for many years um, in her backyard, she t gets uh, sporadic uh, occurrences of common red pole in her yard. And that for bird watchers in this area, that's a really good bird. Um, and January is when she really starts and gets her sightings. And so she you know, right now she's obviously watching her bird feeders and, and uh, looking for them. And where you guys, especially you guys to the north, are going, oh, we get them in our finch feeders all the time. But that's, uh, you know, it, 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 wherever you're at, you know, bird movement, uh, stress, and storms, well, you know, this January's a month that some stuff gets brought in to our area. I, I, you know, at bird feeders, it'd be a common red pole out at uh, area lakes, uh, like Smithville Lake near, here, near here. Um, usually by now, the lake is almost completely frozen over. And then in January, we usually get a little warm spell and we start getting pockets of open water. And those pockets of open water are where we get to see, you know, some some really unusual waterfowl like long-tailed duck, which is a really good bird for us. Um, and, the, you know, some, some of the gulls, some of the big gulls like great blackback gulls uh, show up in January in our area. So January is a month where, you know, birds are having to move to survive. And, that, and, and we can be, you know, bird watchers can actually benefit from that. Oh. Just saw the first red pole sighting reported on Ebert near me in southwest Michigan a few days ago. Yeah, I've been up in Duluth in oh early March, late February, and almost every bird feeder we went by up in that area because everything was covered in snow. You know, we we see a yard with bird feeders hanging in it, and we'd slow down, and there'd be red poles on the on the bird feeders up there. So you know, up in your part of the world, you, you should be getting them in there. I would think any time now. And they're, they're a good bird. And, and if people go, well, what's the difference in that bird? Then, uh, well, it, it's the size of a, a goldfinch. It's going to be feeding with the goldfinches and with the pine siskins. But look at the face. It's got that yellow bill against that black face and has that little, uh, a, a young man told, called it a magenta cap many years ago. It, it's not a red cap. It's a magenta cap. I said, okay. Uh, but uh, they're a pretty little finch. They got that little finch bill. And they're on the, they love Niger, right? and it, it, it see them feeding a lot on on uh, the Niger feeders whenever we do see them. So, but they'll also eat some fine sunflower chips and even millet and things like that. That other finch, that other seeds that finches like as well. Looking at oh, let's see. I thought I just saw a commercial uh, question pop up. Nope, must have been, uh, that's led me. But those, you know, they, these birds are looking for a high energy food. And my next program I'm going to do, I'll do it on uh, Saturday on Facebook, and then it'll be up next uh, next Monday, is I'm going to uh, talk about uh, other high value foods that you can make uh, to offer birds this time of year. And, it, you know, it, it, we're going to uh, make a mixture for you of peanut butter and fine sunflower chips and dried mealworms and the and, and mix those together and get it to the right consistency that, that the birds like and offer those up. Um, and, and, and so if, you, if you're interested in that, it will, so we'll have that posted. Um, but one of the foods that uh, I, I learned from a, a friend, a bird watcher friend years ago that she does uh, this time that she does this time of year is, believe it or not, egg yolks. Um, the, it does sound kind of bad that birds are eating egg yolks, but that's, you know, <laughs> the nature of the, uh, they, they need that energy and what she does, you know, it, she kind of discovered it when she was watching her cholesterol and doing her hard boiled eggs. And she was just throwing the egg yolks away, um, at, at a, because she didn't want to eat them in her salads and stuff. And she started putting the egg yolks out on a window tray feeder and, uh, it, in winter, especially when she started, and boy, the birds were eating those egg yolks. They're full of energy for them. And Carolina wrens and chickadees, especially, were, were coming right up onto the uh, tray and, and eating the egg yolks. And so, if you're somebody that's watching your cholesterol and you want to, you know, uh, don't want to eat your egg yolks, uh, don't just toss them out. You know, give them to the birds and put them out. And you know, they also eat the egg shells. So when you hard boil your eggs uh, and, and give you egg yolks, you also have those egg shells. You, know, you can crush those up, and they'll eat, they'll eat. Birds will eat those if you want to mix that in your tray feeder with your bird seed, and they'll pick through that for the calcium. And and, and so there, you know, nothing's going to go to waste in na nature. So um, the one that you might not expect, and, and you can utilize are uh, egg yolks to help your help your birds out. Now the. Ooh, somebody's had a harlequin duck. Oh, 
on Lake of Michigan was quite the attraction. Yes, Harlequin ducks, if you're not familiar with them, they're absolutely gorgeous ducks. They're mainly a more Northwest duck, uh, but the males are stunning, um, blue and red and the pattern, Harlequin pattern in their face. Uh, yeah, that bird would cause a stir, right? The only the last one I know we had in Missouri was, oh, 30, you no, know, 20, maybe 25 years ago, there was one on a lake here in the Kansas City area. And you're right, uh, Joshua, it calls quite a stir. Uh, a lot of people out there looking for that bird. They're they're really pretty and really rare out here in this part of the world. So I'm sure they are for you in Michigan as well. They, that, they quit now, I, a topic I've got on the list because I had a pretty involved conversation about this today, um, and that is um, about uh, hawks at your bird feeders. Uh, this is a, a, a beautiful Cooper's hawk, and he has called a starling, which is nobody dread, regrets that. I mean, if you could train them to eat the starlings and the house sparrows, I think we'd all be happy. But um, the Cooper's hawks and the sharp shin hawks, and up north, if you have northern goshawks, those as well. Um, but the, they do hunt your bird feeders. I mean, it, it is the classic lions at the water hole scenario and that if you concentrate prey like like all the wildebeest and the antelope and stuff have to go to the water hole and, and the deserts and the lions hang out there and hunt because they know the prey is coming to them well in in mild stretches of winter when the bird feeders are not very busy and birds can uh, they, they're not going to come to the feeders as much because they know it's safer out there in the trees and in the bushes and in, in, in nature, uh, when you come in and a lot of birds are congregating at your feeder during, especially during the harsh parts of winter, then the predators know that and they see the activity and they come in and they've got to eat too. I read an article many years ago called "Feeding Birds with Birds," um, and I know for for most of us tender-hearted people, it's it's hard to whenever you see that Cooper's hawk catch, you know, one of your uh, cardinals or uh, the other day I found the remains of a junco on my deck railing where one had been caught. But that bird has to eat too. Um, and uh, we can't do a whole lot uh, other than, you know, I've, yeah, I've done my program on building brush piles uh, just a week or two ago. Um, and you providing the escape cover um, that helped those birds get out uh, and get into whenever that, that Cooper's hawks come in. But remember, those those occipiters, as they're called, the Cooper's hawks and sharp shins, and they are ambush predators. They come through in great speed, and they catch the birds off guard, and they have that long tail as their rudder. So they can turn and maneuver very quickly and catch birds. And, I mean, it's what they're built to do, and they're going to catch a bird every so often. And, you know, some I know not everybody can build a brush pile, but if you – you know, even lawn furniture, uh, you know, shrubs, anything that they can get around and hide behind or something whenever that those coopers are, are, are barreling in there. I had a cooper's hog tried to get one of my squirrels. It was, <laughs> you know, and they, they cooper's hogs are big enough to, to take, a, especially a smaller squirrel, um, that they, you know, mainly they eat birds, but they can catch mammals, especially cooper's sharp shins are a little smaller and it's a little tougher uh, for them to catch a a squirrel, but yeah, I, I told the story yesterday. I was out filling my bird feeders, and uh, at the corner of my eye, I saw this Cooper's coming from uh, the tree line in our neighborhood, and it came zipping around the the deck. And this is what he does, she does, is a big female, and she comes in, and so she can't. So I'm coming around that, and, and real quickly, surprising the birds at the feeder. Well, there were no birds at the feeder; it was just me. And so when she caught me, she saw me, and boy, she was like. Ah! And she fluttered and she kept going on down the tree line. But yeah, it wasn't what she was expecting. They, you know, they love to just surprise snatch birds off of a bird feeder that's, that's it there. And, and again, they have to eat. Uh, and, and yes, uh, when they're in the area, the birds are going to go up into the trees and the bushes are going to hide and they're going to wait for things to calm down. And, and then they'll start coming back to the feeders and usually chickadees are the bravest and they start coming back to the to the feeders gradually and then the other birds get their confidence and they come back too. Ah, uh, TJ says his, his feeders are under a large umbrella. It keeps the birds hidden. Yeah, I mean, I'm telling you, you know, it doesn't take a lot of cover to help those birds out from these predators. Dave, I can't build a brush pile. Yeah, <laughs> we were, Dave and I were talking about this today about how, uh, yeah, you know, the the, the brush piles are, are not super attractive and to the landscaping, and they're practical. They're not pretty. So, 
a lattice-based structure, yes, might serve the, uh, the birds. I, I agree. I think they will a whole lot. I, like I said, even lawn furniture. Uh, I've, that, that is an effect because those coopers can the sharp shins can't fly through the legs of those uh, of like lawn chairs and your lawn table and things like that. So those could be helpful as well. At, uh, Adrian, I just claimed someone's discarded Christmas tree. Yes. Did you watch my brush pile program? <laughs> exactly. Because that's a, a, it is one of the best little sources of cover. It's, it's an old, uh, a live Christmas tree and, and incorporate that in if you can. And and it doesn't have to be in the middle of the yard. You know, it can be placed, uh, I, you know, in my brush pile program, I talked about how I had to build a brush pile until my landscaping grew up. Now I've got some good cover for the birds uh, naturally uh, with some beautiful uh, native shrubs and things, but it did take me a while. And I have used Use uh, old Christmas trees um, as a brush pile because they that that is very thick cover and those uh, those occipiters just can't get in there and that that's a great one. Oh, uh, Joshua saw a Merlin chowing down on a house sparrow. Now there's a, a good you know Merlins have made an amazing comeback. If you know what Merlins are, Merlins are a member of the Falcon group and uh, you know. The bald eagles, it, rightfully so, got all the publicity about uh, DDT uh, and, and and pushing them to the edge of extinction and their comeback they've made in the lower 48 states where a lot of birds are forgotten that made equally as impressive comebacks. And merlins are a good example of that. We have a lot more merlins uh, than we used to. And I've seen them settle in. Uh, I think when I was in Pittsburgh uh, years ago, they had a group of like 11 merlins settled into this big city park and uh, were hunting in this park uh, there in the Pittsburgh area in winter. So, yeah, merlins are very efficient bird catchers as well. Um, very fast. Uh, they, they do catch uh, shorebirds and lots of things. But um, they, I, I, we don't see them in the neighborhoods very often, but they certainly could be there. No doubt about that. So, you know, yes, I, it, about the, the lattice work. I think any kind of a structure like that, that, that gives the birds confidence will definitely help them. You're never going to completely uh, eliminate uh, birds of prey catching a bird in your yard. Uh, Ruth tells a story uh, years ago that uh, she in her backyard saw this Cooper's hawk in the back, in the back of her yard and this downy woodpecker landed on uh, her peanut feeder and and she said, you know, she had her binoculars on the Cooper's Hawk and she saw it uh, looking at its attention gaze at that downy. And that downy worked this way around the backside to the Cooper's Hawk of the peanut feeder. And that Cooper's Hawk took off, flew really low to the ground. And without looking, you know, just blind, you got up to that feeder, just reached around and snatched that downy off the backside of the, the, the peanut feeder. Um, and that's what they do. I mean, there was nothing that bird, there was nothing that would have helped that downy. Uh, you know, that was just a predator winning you know, right, right there. And if he's going to feed his babies, uh, you know, he, he and survive, he's got to have a bird every once in a while. And luckily, there's a whole lot more downy woodpeckers than there are Cooper's hawks. So unfortunately, that, that downy had to pay the price. So. Ooh, okay. Can you can you give some names of trees to plant? Now, again, Shirley, th this is, has a lot to do with where you are, because um, you know here I, we always recommend planting native plants. And so, what's native and and and, and good to plant in Kansas City is not going to be you know, the more favorable thing, say, in, you know, like say in Texas or uh, in Alabama. There, different plants are adapted to different soil types and things. Um, I'll and see if what I can, can put. I can find a link and put it in uh, to the comments afterwards, maybe tomorrow, get that in the, and, and, and get in there. But, um, you know, you it, we encourage you to wherever you're at, uh, if you can do a Google search on native plants for your area and and the ones they recommend, maybe your conservation, your local conservation department should have uh, materials that, are, that, that they can provide to you. Uh, about what plants they recommend, and you know, even well, like Texas has a, a, a state that size, maybe even whatever part of the state you're in, where uh, you know it, it, they native plants are adapted to your soils, they're adapted to your pollinators, they're adapted. They produce berries and seeds, and and the insects that eat on them are important food for birds. So. I want to encourage you to make sure that, you know, when you, you're considering uh, planting like that, uh, you know, it's where you are and it's really, really important. No doubt about it. Let me see. Oh, I got to put this picture up. Uh, Carrie, who works for me, had, had a good friend of mine. Uh, she took this in her yard. 
uh, very recently. Uh, the the bluebirds and and the water. Uh, I found the last minute to put this in there. I want to make sure I put it up there for because this is a, a really great shot. Um, and it and it blue. I wanted to talk a bit more about bluebirds in winter. Uh, had this question from I think out east today. Somebody asked me about the the, the bluebirds in their yard. And remember it, it, the. We really have two different populations of bluebirds. We tend to have two different populations. We have our nesting birds that nest in our yard, raise their young, and they also have the wintering population. Uh, bird, wintering populations tend to be a lot higher than the nesting time uh, populations of bluebirds in our area because these birds, the winter birds, get pushed down from the north due to harsh weather, and they move in, and they tend to be in small flocks or medium-sized flocks of bluebirds, and they settle in the areas where there's good fruit or soft mass, and they 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 come to blue the, the water. Water is so important. This is a heated bird bath, and so. And I think when they come in and they're drinking at your bird bath, and they see the other birds eating on your at your bird feeders. They'll a lot of times go over and join in and try to figure out what those other birds are eating. Uh, in in the South, right? You know, I grew up in, in North Carolina. In winter, the bluebirds are a lot of times mixed in what we call intraspecific feeding flocks, and that is there'll be bluebirds and there'll be pine warblers and downy woodpeckers and brown creepers and Tufted titmice, red belly, there'd be a lot. There's this mixed species of bird, and they're moving around and they're feeding together all into the woodlands. And usually the core species in those intraspecific flocks are chickadees. Chickadees are smart birds and they're brave birds and they're really good at finding food. So other birds follow chickadees around because if they find food, then the rest of the birds in that little mixed flock are. And so in the fall and early winter, when I'm bird watching, I'm listening a lot of times for chickadees. Because if, if I find a, a chickadees moving around the woods, a lot of times there's other birds following them around. So uh, they're, they're great birds. And, um, and then in February, things shift. A lot of those northern birds that they have come down for the winter tend to move back up north for their nesting territories. So let me see. Will squirrels get in blue houses and eat the eggs? Uh, you know, TJ, uh, they... Not normally. For one thing, a squirrel shouldn't be able to fit into that one and a half inch uh, opening of a bluebird box. Um, but we do know that sometimes, you know, they'll chew out the opening uh, and, and they get their head in there. But they're not they're not known for predating on, on eggs. Uh, it, it, it's not something they normally would do. Now, when times are tough, it, 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 it is possible they would. But that's not I would much more be worried about you know, house wrens getting in and breaking the eggs. And, and of course, uh, house sparrows are the worst enemy for bluebird boxes. And they can get into that one and a half inch hole. So the uh, bluebirds are great. So it just, and this, the, the, you know, bring this up about those winter flocks is at this time of year, we get a lot of questions. And I, I always want to be honest with people. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm a biologist first and a salesman at last. And that is when people come in and say, oh, I've got all these bluebirds at my bird bath and they're feeding. I'm going to go, should I put up bluebird houses? Well, I, I temper that. I take, you know, you, you can. And yes, if your habitat's right, if you've got good open uh, areas, um, but just know that you will always, you'll see these bluebirds here in the winter and like in these numbers, but that doesn't mean these birds are going to stay here and nest. And I, I, it, it, especially in the Southern part of the U.S., that's very, very true. The central and southern part, you always have those winter birds down here, and most of those are going to go back. Now, does that mean you, sh you shouldn't put up a bluebird box? No. I mean, if your habitat is good, you've got a good open space, it's always worth putting a bluebird box up if the, the chances are, because you know, bluebird populations have rebounded nicely, and, and they're they're nesting in areas that, that we haven't seen in you know a while. It's, it, it's great. So, Before you leave, uh... David from Rhode Island says, looking at your picture, do you recommend rocks in a shallow? Absolutely, David. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, the definition of a good uh, uh, bird bath is, is a shallow bird bath. And this bird bath, the Cozy Bird Spot, which I absolutely love, and, and now they, it's like made by a couple of different companies. But um, this, this actually has a hump 
in the center of the bird bath, which is really good because it naturally gives you a little bit shallower water and a little bit deeper water. But yes, a good, a flat rock, a little rock in the middle of your bird bath, somewhere in your bird bath to give birds a chance to land on. And also for smaller birds to be able to bait, you have to, birds have to bathe in the winter, not just drink water, but they also need to preen their feathers and they need water to heal the feathers. So yeah, even on cold days, you'll see birds in the bird bath and you'll think, how can they stand it? But um, they have to do that to keep their, their feathers healthy. Definitely. Shallow is the key when it comes to a good bird bath. And that is one of the biggest, uh, uh, you know, water is, is important, but, you know, the type of water you offer greatly enhances the, the, the bird's ability to utilize the water that you're offering. So absolutely. Let me check my list. Did I say, did I miss anything? I don't know how to hear. Yeah, I think that's everything I had on my list. Now, again, I'm always open to question. What about tree icing or uh, like products at this time of year? Uh, this is from Steve. Yeah, I, Steve, thanks for asking that. Uh, there's a lot of different companies out there that make a spreadable suet. Um, the, the one that we sell is called tree icing. That's the one that we sell. I've heard of bark butter. I've heard of different names. But all this is a spreadable suet, uh, a little bit softer. And a lot of people just like to take it and smear it into bark uh, on a tree, crevices in there, because there are certain species, especially like uh, brown creeper is a great example. And even pileated woodpeckers, uh, some birds that are a little more shy and uh, not as apt to come into a feeder will, are always looking for food and, and, and insects and stuff hiding in bark. And when, when they find some of this spreadable uh, suet smeared into like a knot hole in the tree or even in the bark, um, they can eat that. And that's a good source for them. And that, that, that can get you extra birds that may not come to your feeder, but actually get you feeding there. So, and of course they make feeders where you can smear the uh, the, the tree icing into and hang. It's just a different way of presenting suet. Um, but yeah, I, I like it. It is this time of year is when you want to do that. A lot of the tree icing tends to get um, ooey and uh, uh, melt pretty easily. So, you know, when the temperatures get up into the 80s, you're not going to want to use the tree icing after that until next fall because it, it, it can be pretty gross. So, but yeah, this is the time of year to use the, the tree icing type products. Healthy, 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 Looking forward because there's 20 some people watching. What's that now? Said there's 20 some people watching and oh, let us know where they're watching from. Yep, my my producer wife sitting right over there said that it, there's 20 some people and that's great. Thank you so much. Hope all of you have subscribed. You know, if you want me to be able to keep doing these programs, like you know, hitting that subscribe button really helps us out. Uh, and we really appreciate, appreciate you tuning in. I think everybody's told me where they were from at one point during the conversation. But if you haven't, please let me know where you're you're joining us from. That's always a great thing. Um, if you have any more questions, uh, let me know. Uh, and, and we will try to hit those real quick ideas, before we sign off. Ideas for future lives. TJ's from Georgia. Yeah. What's that? I said ideas for work. Oh, yeah. Ideas and, ideas and I, program, you know, you know I, if you're watching my videos, you know, I end them with give us a like, give us a share. Please send in ideas for future programs. I really mean that. If you guys, what do you want me to talk about? Because we'll we'll do, um, uh, you know, obviously a February uh, a happenings video. And if there's something particular you want me to talk about then, uh, just let me know. Uh, you can contact me. I have all the contact information in the description. I think I got to add that into this one. Louisville, Kentucky, Sue. I was we were just through there on our way back from North Carolina. So we we rode through Louisville on the way here. Uh, Louisville, yeah. Trimming is in from Indiana. It, yep, it, we went through Indiana as well. We had to drive. Ended up having to drive to, to North Carolina because of Southwest Airlines. Um, uh, it, 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 fiasco. So we ended up driving out there and driving back. You're welcome, David. Thanks for joining in. I really appreciate it. South Central Pennsylvania Grant. Just got my first de-icer today. Absolutely best thing you do. Hasn't been really cold here recently, but excited to try it out soon. Absolutely. Uh, you you will not regret buying a, a, a de-icer. Uh, I, I can't, I, and honestly, and I've done this 35 years in the Nature Center world and, of course, with the store. Um, and I cannot even begin to tell you how many people, you know, at some point come in and go, Mark, best thing you ever did was talk me into buying that heated bird bath. 
Pittsburgh by that de-icer. It, it changed everything in my backyard. It, it, it is so important. And I know that in, in an area, maybe in South Alabama, doesn't get cold enough to, to really warrant one down there uh, uh, very often. But here in Kansas City, your bird bath, the heated bird bath gets a, a workout and a typical winter in Pennsylvania, I'm sure will it also, it, it, it'll get quite a workout. And we have warm stretches now, that's for sure. But believe me, whenever it, you need the birds need it, they need it. So TJ, awesome. thank you. Absolutely. I'm glad, I love it. I'm so glad you guys are enthusiastic about it and joining in with me and supporting it. We, we, uh, like I said, I, we love birds. Um, you know, and we, we're excited to to share the the love with other people. And you guys ask the great questions, and, and their involvement is is awesome. So, thanks for joining in. We will be back in a couple of weeks. I'll be on again live, maybe next Thursday. I think I'll have a program to post. But we're, I'm trying to set this up so that every other Thursday I'll be live. So, uh, look forward to, to talking to you guys in the future. Thanks for joining in. Like I said, please hit that subscribe button. Have a good night.